Welcome back to this final uh, video for 2020. It's been quite a year and thank you if you've been watching some or all of these videos this year. But don't forget tomorrow, first day of 2021, I'm going to start over and I have a special video that I'm going to show on January 1st, which is about basically the culmination of the Summa and basically what does St. Thomas Aquinas say about beatitude? What is heaven like? What is our relationship going to be with the Heavenly Father in heaven? And that's how I'm going to start, basically, by starting with the end, and then we'll pick up from there. But for this one, I figure since it's the last day of 2020, I wanted to highlight something at the end of the Summa. And Thomas goes into a lot of detail at the end of the Summa about the last things, you know, death, judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory. I can't cover it all in one video, but I wanted to cover what I find to be one of the more interesting aspects of the Summa, and that is how Thomas describes the glorified body in heaven and how will we be different than we are now when we're in heaven because, of course, it's a, a dogma of our faith that there will be a bodily resurrection, but what will our bodies be like and how will things be different when we're in heaven? So a nice culminating video uh, for 2020. So let's get right to it. And first of all, Thomas asks... And this is a supplement, okay? So you remember Thomas died before the Summa was finished, and then his scribe, Reginald de Paperno, I think is his name, went back, took some of his previous writings, and then he finished it for him. So in Supplement Question 81, Article 1, he says whether all will rise again at the same age. It's an interesting question because take a family like this, you know, obviously we all have different ages and we die at different ages. Some people die at one, some people die at 101. But what is the body going to be like that is resurrected, the one that comes back, whether it's, you know, decomposed already or was cremated or what have you? Interesting the way Thomas answers this because he does believe that everybody's body is going to be the same age. So what age will that be? Well, funny you asked. He says, man will rise again without any defect of human nature, because as God founded human nature without a defect, even so will he restore it without defect. Now, human nature has a twofold defect. First, because it has not yet attained to its ultimate perfection. That means babies. You know, and I don't think anybody would say a baby has the perfect body, you know, at six months. It can't do much. Can't even walk yet. Uh, so certainly it's growing into perfection, right? Secondly, because it has already gone back from its ultimate perfection. Nobody would say a 90-year-old has a perfect body because they're not as strong as they once were. So somewhere in between those two, we reach the age of perfection, right? The, um, the first defect is found in children, the second in the aged, and consequently in each of these, human nature will be brought by the resurrection to the state of its ultimate perfection, which is in the youthful age at which the movement of growth terminates and from which the movement of decrease begins. All right, so that's kind of interesting. And, and by the way, just out of curiosity, I looked up the average age of sports figures. And you may or may not know this, you probably don't, but the average age of an NFL player is 26 years old. The average age of a NBA player is 26 years old. The average age of a Major League Baseball player is 30, a little bit older. And the average age of an Olympian is 27. So you would figure the prime age athletically, physically for a human being would be mid-20s, 26, 27, thereabouts. Some people have speculated that because Jesus died at 33 years old, that that's the perfect age. In fact, I think in another writing, St. Thomas even proposes that. It's not in the Summa. I know he doesn't say that in the Summa, but he may in a, a different writing that I haven't read about. Okay. Now we're just going to quickly go over the four qualities of the resurrected body according to St. Thomas Aquinas. We're now in Supplement Question 82, Article 1, and he asks, will they... Uh, the bodies be impassable. Now, the impassibility refers to the passions. Are we going to still feel anger? Are we going to feel, you know, have illness and aches and pains and hurt and, you know, suffering from from uh, things like that? Are we going to be de de depressed or, or sad? And then uh, what Thomas says here, I jumped onto that a little bit early. <laughs> uh, basically, he's going to say that 
the, the, the common theme of all these is that the body is going to be subject to the rational soul. Our mind will have perfect control of our bodies, kind of like Adam and Eve did at the beginning of time. So he says, it is impossible for agent to overcome patient except through the weakening of the hold which the form of the patient has over its matter. If we speak of the passion which is against nature, for it is of passion in this sense that we are speaking now. So Adam and Eve had integrity. They were in a state of justice, which meant that their body did not rebel against their rational mind. Okay, They had no carnal sin, so to speak. Their, the only sin that they committed was pride, and that was more a, a sin of the will, but not of the body, right? Uh, for matter is not subject to one of two contraries except through the cessation or at least the diminution of the hold which the other contrary has on it. Now the human body and all that it contains will be perfectly subject to the rational soul. You got to keep that in mind. The body will be perfectly subject to the rational soul, even as the soul will be perfectly subject to God. That's the definition of freedom. When we are subject to God, we are free. All right. Freedom doesn't mean license. Freedom means doing what's right. And OK, wherefore, it will be impossible for the glorified body to be subject to any change contrary to the disposition whereby it is perfected by the soul. And consequently, those bodies will be impassable. So there will be no anger or sorrow or depression or pain or angst or any of that kind of stuff that we often deal with here below. All right, the second quality is subtlety. What does subtlety mean? And this is, again, quite interesting. Basically, it means can our body move through physical objects? Now, where did Thomas get this? Remember when the apostles were in the upper room after Jesus had died and he visited them, he came through the wall. Remember they said the door was locked, but he entered anyways. They didn't let him in. He just entered through. And so this is where we get the idea that our bodies will be able to go through physical objects. Now, what physical objects are there going to be in heaven? Is there going to be walls? Are there going to be, you know, glass? I mean, we, we just don't know that. Subtlety takes its name from the power to penetrate. Hence, it is said, Aristotle, that a subtle thing fills all the parts and the parts of parts. And since in rare bodies, the form is more predominant over the matter, uh, the term subtlety has been transferred to those bodies which are most perfectly subject to their form and are most perfectly, uh, are, are fully perfected thereby, by reason of which human bodies are said to be subtle with result from the dominion of the glorified soul, which is the form of the body over the body, by reason of which dominion of the glorified body is said to be spiritual as being wholly subject to the spirit. Hence the apostle, as the master expounds, Peter Lombard, in speaking of spirituality, indicates subtlety. Wherefore, Gregory says that the glorified body is said to be subtle as a result of a spiritual power. All right, we can move through walls. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? That's what he talks about by subtlety. I don't know why we need to do that, but, you know, maybe in heaven that's kind of a cool thing to be able to do. All right, the third quality of the resurrected body is agility. Uh, will we be agile? And what exactly does that mean? It basically means that we can transport ourselves, teleport ourselves. We don't have to move, you know, take steps, you know, just like the angels can will themselves to be somewhere. Well, our bodies can be willed to be somewhere else. Uh, the glorified body will be altogether subject to the glorified soul so that not only will there be nothing in it to resist the will of the spirit, for it was even so in the case of Adam's body, but also from the glorified soul, there will flow into the body a certain perfection whereby it will become adapted to that subjection. And this perfection is called the gift of the glorified body. Now, the soul is united to body no long, not only as its form, but also as its mover. Uh, and in both ways, the glorified body must needs be most perfectly subject to the glorified soul. Wherefore, even as by the gift of subtlety, the body is wholly subject to the soul as its form, whence it derives its specific being, so by the gift of agility, it is subject to the soul as its mover, uh, so that it is prompt and apt to obey the spirit in all the movements and actions of the soul. So if we want to move from one place to the other, and we just will it, and our body moves. Now, uh, 
Here's the question. He asks in Article 3 of Question 84 in the supplement, is it going to be instantaneous or do we actually like, like, like move, you know, you know, place by place? And so here's the question. If we were going from New York City to Iceland to, you know, France, you know, with uh, this kind of uh, agility, would we just think it and we're there or, you know, how, how would that all work out? Uh, he says, opinion is much divided on this point. For some say that a glorified body passes from one place to another without passing through the interval, just as the will passes from one place to another without passing through the interval, and, the ki and that consequently it is possible for the movement of a glorified body like that of the will to be instantaneous. Uh, but this will not hold, because the glorified body will never attain to the dignity of the spiritual nature, just as it will never cease to be a body. Moreover, when the will is said to move from one place to another, it is not essentially transferred from place to place because in neither place is it contained essentially, but it is directed to one place after being directed by the intention to another. And in a sense, it is said to move from one place to another. So he's saying that it isn't instantaneous, but how fast does it move? Well, he goes on to say, hence others with greater probability hold that a glorified body moves in time but that this time is so short as to be imperceptible and that nevertheless one glorified body can pass through the same space in less time than another because there is no limit to the divisibility of time no matter how short a space may take. Okay, so he comes down with the opinion that we just move so fast, even though we're moving, you know, in space, that it's almost imperceptible. Okay, won't that be cool? So you want to be in the next room or the next you know, a mile away, you just will it and boom, <laughs> uh, you're, you're there. All right, finally, clarity. All right, clarity just means like when Jesus appeared in his transfigured form and he was white or Moses was white as snow, you know, what, what is the body going to look like? Is it going to be white and shiny and uh, translucent? Okay, that's what he's getting at here. And he says, it is necessary to assert that the resurrection of the bodies of the saints will be lightsome on account of the authority of Scripture, which makes this promise. But the cause of this clarity is ascribed by some to the fifth or heavenly essence, which will then predominate in the human body. Since, however, this is absurd, <laughs> um, it is better to say that this clarity will result from the overflow of the soul's glory into the body. For whatever is received in anything is received not according to the mode of the source whence it flows, but according to the mode of the recipient wherefore clarity which in the soul is spiritual is received into the body as corporeal and consequently according to the greater clarity of the soul by reason of its greater merit so too will the body differ in clarity so not all of the bodies will be equally in clarity some will be brighter than others some will be different but we're all going to be in glory but there will be levels okay just like we learned earlier in the summa based on our desire, based on our charity, based on our different level. Everybody will be perfectly happy, but some people will be, their happiness will uh, be different and, in a, and, and exceed the happiness of the others. Okay, so this is the final video of 2020. I hope you enjoyed it. The four conditions of the human body. Uh, it's impassable. It's clarity, uh, agile, and subtle. All right, so that's what we can look forward to when and if we are blessed to get to heaven one day. All right. Thank you. Don't forget, tomorrow we'll start 2021 with the end of the Summa, talking about what is Beatitude like. I hope you'll join me in going through the Summa in 2021. God bless you and thank you for joining me in 2020. And I look forward to seeing you in the new year.